Welcome everyone. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Nahumai, Hiremai, Tenekoto, Tenekoto, Tenekoto Katua, Na Mihi Nui Kia Katua Katua. Warm greetings to everyone who is joining us here in New Zealand and from across the globe. It is a pleasure to welcome you to the lecture of Anastasia Nicolagiani as part of the Thinkers and Doers lecture series. We are live streaming on Facebook at the International Federation of Landscape Architects page. My name is Bruno Marquez and I am the program director for the Landscape Architecture program at the Teerengawaka Victoria University of Wellington. The Thinkers and Doers lecture series aims at bringing together practitioners, scholars, students, and our wider community of landscape architects, but also the affiliated built environment disciplines to share ideas and to hear the latest innovations in the field. This is an initiative between the New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects, our Wellington branch, and the Landscape Architecture Program at Victoria University of Wellington. Our third speaker, Anastasia Nicolagiani, is a research fellow and consultant at Birmingham City University in the UK, and she's part of the CAT ID BCU team, an international multidisciplinary research design and consultancy hub. The work, the work they produce aims to place quality of life and sustainability oriented transformation at the top of the political agenda. Anastasia holds a PhD in landscape architecture and climate emergency, and her work is primarily focused on climate change issues, the extent to which special quality and low carbon can be delivered in regional landscape design, as well as the visual representations uh, that contribute to the design process. In her spare time, and because she has plenty of it, she is also the chair of the Emerging Professionals Group at the International Federation of Landscape Architects, but also she takes part in various other professional committees, such as policy and communications, as well as climate emergency and biodiversity response at the Landscape Institute in the United Kingdom. The talk that she is about to present is, is titled Climate Crisis, Landscape-Led Models for a Carbon Neutral Future, this lecture touches upon the climate challenges we face and the impact these have to the value of our landscape, our communities and economies. Using real life projects, she will discuss on innovative models that have demonstrated the significance of policy transformation and the landscape in strategic design within multidisciplinary teams and uh, collaboration processes. Just some very quick um, housekeeping rules. Uh, do not forget that Anastasia will be sharing your screen, so keep this window open so you can see her slides. Also, please remain muted throughout the talk to avoid any background noise. At the end of this talk, you will have the opportunity for questions, either verbally or in written through the chat box uh, in Zoom. Please. Join me in giving Anastasia a warm welcome all the way from Birmingham, England, uh, into our public webinar. Anastasia, the stage is yours. Welcome. Um, or good morning for you, actually. Good evening for us. Thank you very much, Bruno, for uh, uh, inviting me and the Victoria University of Wellington. So really look forward to share with you some thoughts today. So let me share my screen first. Hope it works fine. Let me know if, if it doesn't. Um, so it hasn't come up yet. Oh, okay. Hopefully. <laughs> this is the moment when we think technology can literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, now, now it's coming up. Yeah, now Excellent. it's working. So usually takes 
th I think it takes a few seconds, so I'll try to um, think about that while I'm presenting. So hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. And again, thank you, Bruno Marquez and Victoria University of Wellington for inviting me in this lecture. Uh, talking about climate crisis and landscape-led models, I would like to start with posing a, a question, even though it might be early in the morning for you. Uh, I would like you to think where, you, where you've come from. I would like you to bring in mind the landscape you've grown up, uh, the memories you have from this land, could be young age or maybe later on, and how this has shaped the way you're thinking or interacting with, with the land. Um, and how your roots, your memories with that, and how this has probably uh, defined you as a person or as a community in general. Sharing my own experience from Peania, Greece. I live in the UK, but uh, I am from Greece, Peania, where I've been um, quite lucky in my hometown to have close links with the environment from a very young age. And therefore, this has helped me to realize how important and significant the environment and the landscape is. And also, um, things, simple things we think, like how we produce our food, uh, where we're part of the land, we're part of a community, uh, what are the benefits of nature, of landscape in our daily lives. So with that thought in your mind, um, I would like you to, to, to keep it in your mind and take it with you in what we're going to discuss tonight. So keeping these images you have from your past, or maybe even present, if, if this is so significant for you, let's think how we've moved from something like that from the environment to something like this. Climate emergency. Where are we heading, really? Uh, we've all seen pictures like this, um, global challenges, people struggling for their lives, struggling for their uh, future, next generation, businesses. Um, shocking images, really, that somehow make us realize how important such of these issues are. And they, they tend to, to help us somehow, probably because they're quite scary, to think, you know, what's next? next? Sometimes we think there's nothing we could do or nothing we could control. But I would argue that all of us, either as landscape architects, designers, planners, or even individuals, could do something. And I, I reckon that's why we're here tonight or today for you. So what is the impact of this? Uh, climate emergency? What is the impact in our landscape, in our daily lives, uh, the communities we live in, all the businesses we, we lead? What is the impact in our social activities and our economy? We have to take under consideration that these are not phenomena that happen suddenly or, you know, a one-off experience, but these are becoming uh, a common, a common uh, routine for, for all of us, in, no matter where we are in the world. So um, make ones wonder, is it really just about the landscape? Or and is it really just a climate crisis, as some people ask, still ask me today, a climate change, as st some people still ask me today? Or is it actually a crisis? Well, I, I would argue it's a climate crisis, and it is an emergency. We have to do something for it. And we have to think. We, we need to start, really start thinking. Some of the areas that we know are, are in our surroundings, where we live at, that they might change in their future. Some areas, as for example, I have one here in Fulliermeni, um, Lemos, they, they're part of the mainland, but with half meter rise, water level rise, they might become an island. So what is really resilience okay. and how is the resilience possible in across a city, across uh, the scale of a city or a region, the poor, the poor and the wealthy areas, it is a tricky term really and we have to start really thinking about it and also about what a sustainable future will look like. <coughs> so for example, um, Greece has 16,000 square uh, kilometers of a coastline and one third of Greeks live approximately to a distance of two kilometers from the coast. How could, could we build a sustainable future for our economy, our businesses, and our, our communities? And how is this possible when we have to compete with such phenomena? So the question here is, 
not just a, a simple linear question that has to do with landscape or climate crisis, but it, are, it also consists of our economies, communities, social activities, and ourselves as individuals and as uh, businesses, probably, or practices. And of course, in all of these crises we have um, used in the part, we have been part of in the past, we're using temporary measures, which is, they're fine. There is a crisis, we need to do something, but is it enough? Or may I, may I say that some, sometimes we tend to find that these temporary measures become a little bit more permanent than, temp, than the temporary, uh, than they should be. So do we need something far bigger? Do we need a plan or a strategic vision that actually allow us to design or incorporate all these uh, future phenomena in our lives? And also, how could we avoid the mistakes of the past? How can we say and evaluate what we have been doing so far and turn it to something positive if it's not good enough or improve it uh, if it's good? And then something that sometimes, sometimes ourselves, even, even though we work in this area of climate crisis, we also do. We think sometimes of climate crisis, an emergency, something far away, something where, you know, our area or our, our friends, family, community, they're not going to be affected. Of. But is it true? Is it really far away? Or is it somewhere very, very close to home, really? And what, what the phenomena have been showing the last couple of years, uh, well, not couple of years, the last decades, but the last three to five years, they're actually really building up. So we often underestimate the impact of all this. We evaluate and examine these as separate problems. We have a flood or a drought or a fire, and this is part of the climate change. But no, this is, they are, these factors or these assets are all interconnected, and these are part of a crisis or an emergency, as I would like to call it. And then allow me to address one of the elephants in the room today. Um, what? a pandemic can suddenly do for in relation to the climate crisis. COVID-19, coronavirus, coronavirus, we've heard it so many times over the last uh, few, three, four, five months. Um, but actually, what I would like you to think today is the relationship with the air pollution, floods, fires, droughts, and climate phenomena. So I'm taking the example of China just because it was the first one. So we have official re results uh, from NASA, the Earth Observatory, and have a look here. So we have January 2020. This graph shows the air pollution, the nitro nitrogen dioxide over uh, China. And look at February, just one month later. There is evidence that the change is at least partly related to the economic slowdown following, following the outbreak of COVID-19, of the coronavirus. But this is not what I want to show you. I want to show you the next slide, where we have February compared to April, May, so still a month ago. But look at this. We are doing the same thing again. So we stopped for a bit, fine. Air pollution went down, logical, sensible. And now we're doing exactly the same thing. It's not up to 500 micromole as it was before, uh, but it is up to 250 micromole. So we're doing the same thing. We, we, we stopped for a bit, but now the economy is actually growing. We keep going. So I would like to say that we've all experienced or still experiencing the coronavirus differently. Um, and it, I think, from what I've collected and gathered from colleagues and friends and practitioners, that it's fair to say that we've all turned to open spaces, nature, and areas of contemplation with one way or another. So the question here is, why is this suddenly so important? Why we've learned to appreciate nature and the power of freedom and opportunity to walk or cycle just in the, in the, fi in the five uh, months, in the last five months? I'm not saying everyone has done it, but there is a, a general sense that all of us have actually urged to go outdoors much more than we wanted to go before, that we were allowed to. So we've turned to nature and back to the landscape, but is it gonna, 
it was here, it was there this time. Is it going to be there next time? Hopefully, we won't have a similar crisis in the near future, but is it going to be there? And have we wondered what is the impact of our activities to all this? So, I would like to propose um, something. I would like to propose that we need a fresh pair of eyes. We need to, to think um, and see things differently. And we need to actually address our lives, our businesses, our economy in a different way. So as individuals, but as also as landscape architects, designers, planners, whatever we are, we need to design or go, go about our lives with something or someone else in mind. Either this could be future generations, they could be uh, animals, they could be nature or so much more. And we need to stop planning just, you know, with our only focus, the economy. Yes, of course, the economy is important. I'm not coming from another planet, but we need the community to be part of this. We, and the economy will come. And I, if I dare say, I think we'll be even more successful if the community is there. And also as part of this crisis uh, that we're living in the last five months, we have heard phrases like nature, takes back, uh, animals take, take, sorry, nature takes over our cities, animals take over our cities, etc. But do they actually take over or do, do they take it back? Um, something that probably belonged to them for a little while. Or and is it a coincidence that uh, they've sensed that we've been finally been quiet for a little while and they've got out to explore uh, the cities while we're exploring the great outdoors for them. And if I dare say, it seems perfect time, perfect from these pictures, perfect uh, day for a city tour. And also they tend to keep the two meters distance as well. So they know what they're doing about. So with this in mind, let's think, so what do we do? What, uh, what landscape architecture, design and planning could do about it? And how, how, or what do we mean with low carbon landscape or, or new, new landscape carbon neutral, uh, zero carbon, etc. I tend to use an example of buildings because, not because it's easy, but because it's a little bit easier to understand it in our, in our mind. So when you design a, a zero carbon building or carbon neutral building, you think, we'll, we think ventilation, phasing the sun, insulation materials, some of, uh, some of the ingredients of this. But landscape, how can we do that? How we can design um, a space, an open space, a region, a big area, and make sure it is really sustainable or low carbon or zero carbon, whatever you want to call it. And I think this is about feelings. It's about communi communities. And it's also about social identity. It's not just about materials and buildings and engineering work. So I would like to take you through three models I've chosen today, three different projects, uh, strategic design and large scale projects. I, I would like, and I would like to clarify now that each country and region has different conditions, obviously. So these models demonstrate principles um, that apply to their countries, but I think most of them or, or some of them also apply to different countries. And again, um, all of these qualities, so what you see here as climate adaptation, design quality, transformation, decision making, etc. All of these projects have them somewhere uh, within their process or framework. But I have just picked uh, the key, what I think they're the, the stronger points for each model. That doesn't mean that the others don't have it. And of course, there are little asterisks there, policy that runs through across all of them. So the first one, uh, climate adaptation and design quality is a big strategic landscape design project. It is about climate adaptation and it has two main goals. It had because it's been completed, water safety and special quality. We're talking about the Room for the River program. It is actually spread across the Netherlands in 34 different locations um, and addresses the water safety problem. Obviously the water rising level of four different rivers and more. It is about special quality as much as it is about water safety. And this is the key with this project, this program, as I call it. It has a huge impact uh, on the region 
with shows so far, um, big scale as well, and also it has impacted uh, on their legislation and laws. So how have they done it? We have, they have designed when they were building it, they decided on nine different ways on literally making room for the river. So they have from water storage to removing obstacle, ob obstacles such as bridges or other, other obstacles, uh, dike relocation, dike re depoldering, lots of different ways uh, to do that. But again, the key thing is not just about the engineering fact, not just about nine different uh, engineering ways to address the problem, which is the rising water levels. They have done it by creating really, truly quality landscape. And I'm gonna show you, present two exceptional examples, in my opinion, from these 34. The first one is the city of Nijmegen, in the city of Nijmegen and Lent. It's an urban scheme. And in this case, uh, it, is, it is the biggest project of this program on a budget. So what it has happened, they have created a whole new path for the river Val that it used to flood. We're talking about uh, an, uh, they're creating a whole island, an extraordinary location of businesses, housing, a beach, residential areas, and touristic and cultural areas. So what has happened as a summary of this, and I'm gonna go through in detail in a bit, is that they didn't just want to create more room for the river, full stop. They just wanted to give their people and also community and tourists as well, an area where they would be happy and proud to live, off, live at. They wanted to create identity and landscape. And this is a summary of how they've done it. So you see here on, on uh, number one image that the dike here, I hope you see my mouse. So the dike is there with green. What they've done is they removed the dike inland by 350 meters and they have literally dug the land uh, out and they have created a whole new path or room as they call it for the river. What has this done? From two waterfronts, they now have four waterfronts, they have a brand new island, areas for social activities, for entertainment, a beach, businesses, really high views, housing, um, bridges to cycle and walk. But this is not it doesn't stop here. This is not just about it. It doesn't, it doesn't stop here. And this is the key thing with, um, with the room for the river. It really takes it from concept down to implementation. And it really has this uh, conceptual framework through, runs through the whole, prog the whole program. So one example of implementation, I think it's really, really powerful, is the Citadel Bridge. It's just one of the bridges you will see um, you saw just in the small graph before. And what they have done here, so when it's um, a normal day, let's say, no flood, there this bridge you could cycle and walk, go from the one side to the other. But when you have uh, really high water levels, the bridge floods, so you are forced to take the stones, the stepping stones. So by having a bridge where you can walk and cycle, but then you need to use stone steps when it's flooded, it makes us think. By forcing our body to make it, to, to do something which changes it from our usual roots, it forces our mind to think. And I think it's brilliant. I think it's about education. It's about awareness. It's about making us realize what actually climate crisis is, what flood means, and working and living with water, not just hidden it, hidden, hidden it away somewhere else as we've tend to do in the past, some of, some of our mistakes. Um, so it is about education and awareness as much as it is about delivery and as much as, much as it is about concept. The second example I would like to show you from the room for the river is a total opposite from Norward. Norward is a very urban, uh, so, uh, sorry, Nijmegen is a very urban location. Norward that I'm showing you now is a very rural location. So you will see all this area here is with agriculture, it used to have kettles as well, but um, kettles and animals have been removed with their own, as I've been told, with their, their, it was their own decision, not from the designers or the team there. So what happened here 
is that this red line used to be the dike around us. And um, I have to say that Norvard was actually the largest project of the Room for the River program. So it's about 4,450 hectares, and the catchment area is around 10,000 square kilometers. So it is really huge. It is a big area. And how have they decided to address the problem of water safety there? Well, they said, let's flood Norvard. And the concept was really building with nature, influenced by design with nature of Ian McCarg. So the extraordinary thing is that they have made calculations that you see now in these graphs coming, hopefully, uh, of how the water will be moving throughout the years and throughout um, the, the, let, the water level, depending on how high the rise will be. And I have to say that this is an area that floods um, regularly, every couple of years. It's not something that it might happen in the future. But the extraordinary is on this slide, uh, which you see almost two and a half meters, this is a chance of one every hundred years. And the next and final one is that it's almost 300 meters, sorry, three meters, not 300, hang on, three meters. Um, it's it's a chance of one every thousand years. So you see the calculations they have done and the effort that it has been put into that. But again, this doesn't stop there. The important bit is the next bit. The important bit is, is they haven't just addressed this as an engineering project. They have brought special quality out of it. Quality elements, materials, plants, they have really created areas to walk, socialize, um, kayak, or take the boat. They've even think, thought um, how, how they will go about this fort here. This is a fort where um, top left image. And obviously by removing the dike, that was at risk because it is, it is a historic feature for them. So they have created a natural dike uh, by willow, a willow forest, willow trees, and they have even planted the trees in a specific sequence and they have two different cultivars, two different species in case something goes wrong, something is affected by an insect on Fuji, fungi in one of them. So this is again a project that has to do with environmental education, with looking the value of the landscape, um, contemplation and social benefits, how you turn, the water, you turn a water pump to an area where people could go and see the view of the whole area. So this is the first model uh, that has to do with how a uh, concept works from, from the very broad levels down to the implementation. The next model I would like to present is, about, is all about transformation and decision making. It is about seeing a region differently uh, through conceptual drawings, um, how do you evaluate and think about design, how do you actually um, create or regenerate an area, um, either this is a city or region. This is about the National Park of the West Midlands, the project we're working on here in BCU with Catherine Moore, and it is all about creating an iconic landscape and enhancing identity of place. So the broader concept of this is about strategic initiatives, how we could utilize this throughout the West Midlands Combined Authority in the UK, um, how you, we can propose a new type of national park, not with the strict definition that we've used to as a national park, and of course how we have built in collaboration, citizen um, engagement and stakeholder engagement as well as policies. So it is the whole project, it takes us through and exploration through drawings and visuals to, to aiming to building on a new iconic landscape for the region. It is about perceptions, it is about um, the, putting the landscape as the very core of every process or every design we do in the future. It introduces quality of space as a vital aspect of regional infrastructure. And it is also about seeing things differently. It's about understanding the landscape, understanding what's there, uh, our surroundings. Is it about water as this graph so here? Or is it about poverty, about deprivation areas, areas where we could explore nature more or less, rivers, canals, using design to redefine 
our region in a way and changing perceptions um, by forming policy and also uh, with the support of local and national governance. So forming, somehow using design or a broader vision to drive transformation and forming decision making. And, and again, again, this looks about the role of drawing and the visual, the, the role of powerful visuals, how these could be very impactful on transformation. And again, of course, um, technology, how you could see the impact of a project on businesses, social life impact and all of that. So this really uses the power we have as designers and landscape architects to create a whole approach, a holistic approach that has to do with sustainability, with economy, with the future of, a, of an area. And then we go to the next and third model that has to do with natural assets, assets and collaboration and knowledge. I need to say that this is a pan-European project that I'm going to present now. And um, it is a collaboration between the, the UK in Birmingham, Italy, Trento and Gothenburg in Sweden. It is called Saturn. Systemic, uh, system and sustainable approach to features interaction to urban and rural landscapes. And as we, as we see it here in the UK, uh, we see it as a case study almost of the West Midlands National Park because it, it has the power, it, it can demonstrate how some of these ideas we're talking on the National Park could be implemented. But the project itself, it, it, is, in, it is still ongoing. It's one year and a half, yeah, one, one year and a half that is running now. So you won't see final results but you will see where, what the ideas that it's built upon and where we've been through so far. And I'm saying this is about regenerating, reintegrating our natural assets and also um, creating collaboration, creating knowledge and exchange of knowledge between different cities. So it does focus, Saturn focuses on the relationship between cities, food growing, the landscape, and the progress made to generate holistic strategic frameworks. It is about uh, institutional change as much as it is about transformation. And it has three tiers, tiers as we say. Um, so the first approach is, the first tier, sorry, is holistic, to build a holistic special approach and framework. When the second is about utilizing our ecosystem services and natural capital to map and evaluate the landscape potential. So what is the value of the landscape on these cities that participate? And then the third builds upon systems approach, revealing hidden beneficiary, talking about stakeholder engagement and building on capacity building. So we're trying to establish a strong narrative with public and private stakeholders on this. This is highly a collaborative, pro collaborative project and build or design at the end uh, come up with a flexible framework to guide cities through something like that to guide cities guide cities of on how they could actually be more sustainable evaluate their assets natural assets uh, in the future make um, the initiative we try to we'll try to make it economically sustainable obviously and scalable so again as landscape architects we all know that there's no one size fits all but um, we would like to uh, see this being used, being the principles being extracted and being used in different countries, regions uh, and continents. And again, we'll probably provide some tools and metrics to support some of the decision making. So the three hubs, as we call them, UK, Italy and Sweden, they build on local, on local knowledge, but also they build on themselves. There is a very strong link between the partners of the hub. Birmingham um, is leading or creating a strategy holistic approach on principles and visioning. Trento is uh, looking more into governance and decision-making processes and Gothenburg is really strong in farming entrepreneurship, so utilizing abandoned land. And I have to say here something similar to what I said with the projects before, the three, mod the three models. Again, it's not that each of these hubs um, do what they only know or they only focus with no attention to the other. We, they all have these qualities and we all try to deal and address all these different areas. But I'm just 
mentioning here what are the focuses for each or the strong the strongest point for each of the locations so uh, the first uh, the expert building on the expertise of the UK on landscape vision, identity, and strategic planning, and again with Birmingham being a biophilic city, uh, one of a few biophilic cities, um, there's a huge interest here in terms of environmental aspects. Trento is has managed to create policy in terms of strategic documents and design areas used to develop strategically planned networks or natural or semi-natural areas. And then Gothenburg has, together with other four municipalities, have managed to create a model for mapping and map making uh, underutilized or abandoned land from the city and giving it to new entrepreneurs, new farmers that they want to scale up their businesses. So what it is about as a summary, it is about a landscape as common good. Saturn is about urban and rural regeneration, restoration, social inclusion. But also, most of, most of all, it is about valuing our landscape, integrating our natural assets, uh, creating strategic documents and policy that they could support our cities, local authorities, governments, etc. And of course, it's about stakeholder engagement and collaboration throughout these cities and exchanging knowledge. So I've, I've shared with you three, very briefly obviously, three uh, key models that I think three key projects, big projects that I think they're quite relevant and significant in terms of climate change and landscape architecture, but what could we extract from this? So I think you might have noticed already that all of these have some key qualities. They all have a visionary concept, a unique, it might seem similar or familiar, but it is actually specialized, unique for their own area or region. They have a tailor-made project framework for their area, uh, governmental support or local, sub local authority support uh, and design as part of it. And again, they all have clear goals integrated to the design and planning. Obviously, Saturn didn't see that much more because we're not in that stage, but we're at the stage where we, we're creating a vision for it and an approach, holistic approach for it. Uh, what is something that has come, it's really, really important in this strategic project is securing design and these qualities through processes and legislation. And this is something that it is an area, policy is an area that's growing. It's run across all the three models I have presented today. Some of the professional associations already picking up this to support practices, support local authorities. And that's actually uh, something I'm very happy about that um, policy is becoming quite significant, recognized in a way uh, in areas such as landscape and climate crisis. Uh, for example, we're doing some work uh, here with the Landscape Institute in the UK and linking policy with climate emergency. And we see that these areas are already looking very promising because individuals and designers are interested. We are all interested, I hope so. Uh, but we also, we need support on how to do that. It needs to be a bigger movement. It could be bottom up, but it could also be a top, a top down approach, which it needs to be both in a way, which leads me nicely to the next slide, which is about communication and multidisciplinarity. So all of these projects, all of them have multidisciplinary teams. There are several layers to secure mutual understanding. What do we mean by climate crisis? What do we mean by sustainability? What uh, benefits the economy has for them, uh, the economy has for its region or its city? There is continuous communication within the teams. And if you ask me, is it easy? Well, no. Is there always an agreement? No way. But this is the whole point, that we put together a framework, we discuss, we exchange ideas and exchange knowledge with multiple layers of interaction and understanding to, to make sure that some of the core values on these strategic schemes are protected. And addressing climate crisis, as well as landscapes, economies and communities are core values as far as I'm concerned. 
So I would like to vouch for something. I would like to vouch for a way forward, borrowing this graph uh, from Vienna Quellan. Uh, we hopefully this COVID crisis is going to pass quickly, let's hope, um, and we could all go back to our families, friends, but please don't go back to normal as far as climate change is concerned. Let's go forward instead. Thank you very much for listening to me coming here tonight. Thank you, Anastasia, for that uh, very inspiring lecture. Uh, you know, it's very timely here in New Zealand as we became COVID-19 free some days ago. So we are very, very excited about it. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Um, we are very excited about what the future will be holding to us um, in the near future. Um, so now it's time for the questions and you can either uh, ask the question directly to Anastasia or you can type uh, your question in the chat box. And we're going to start with a question that Chris Cameron wrote uh, in the chat, which is sea level rise will mean that our urban coastal areas will look different in the future. The key questions seem to be what can we do, re what can we realistically do, and what do we want our places to look like in the future? Are these questions included in approaches you have discussed? Yes, these are really key questions um, that they are included. They are included in all of them, one way or the, or the, or the other. So, um, for example, the room for the river, they, th that I described it very, very quickly, but this is actually a process that took them from the floods of 1993-1995 up to 2015-16 when I visited it, uh, when it was finalizing it. So it took them from 95 to realize that they cannot keep going like that uh, to 2015 to actually put it in the ground and implement it. So you, the key thing is exactly what you're asking, Chris, is the city, the region, the, the stakeholders that take part of that, they really need to sit down and think, what do we want our city to look like in the future or region or area or community? And this is something we also do in the National Park uh, proposal and Saturn is touching upon that as well. So we're, we're having workshops with stakeholders sitting down, trying to make them think or draw or design or you know, cr create ideas about why, what they would want their areas to look like is not a simple answer, obviously, um, and it's not such an easy thing we say we want to do, put a sustainability neighborhood label in every kind of our neighborhoods or a, a cycle route in, in every location because the key point is what does it look like and how, how do we make sure this, is, this brings the quality we want to have from the future? So yes, um, to answer your question, they do include it, I couldn't go through in very, I mean, we would need a lecture for each of these projects in a way to go through in very, in very detail. Um, but these, are, the process they have followed to do these are stakeholder workshops, uh, community workshops, public workshops, either through drawing or designing or brainstorming to bring these out from the designers themselves, as well as uh, the public hope that answers it. Okay, another question from Pippa Somerville. Um, thank you, great projects. Did development proposal or proposals consider the carbon footprint of the physical works of development slash intervention? So footprint, a huge discussion. We are only talking, this applies only to uh, the Netherlands so far because, well, a bit, and a bit, a bit in Saturn, the, the National Park proposal is now ready to take off. So it has been a research proposal so far, and we have discussed, we're now discussing with the region and the city of how we could actually start, not building the start, putting it into ground, a bit more deliverable, implementing it in a way, but not implementing it with a sense of building something. Uh, but thinking about it in a broader scale. So um, for, the, for the first project, the Room for the River, it was carbon foot, footprint has been considered. I don't have the numbers yet, but as you, as you would expect, it has been a huge, I mean, the emissions for creating something like 
an island, for example, in the in the area of, of Nijmegen, um, it they were huge. They were really big. However, they have calculated that throughout the years, and with the benefit that they have from flood and all the other benefits they have from special quality as well as economic benefits and nature that it has been it will build up in the area somehow it, it's equal um, of course this had three or four major bridges built up so we're talking about a, a quite big carbon footprint and again the Norvat area um, there was there was lots of activity to create this project but these have been calculated and they're constantly new tools as far of as far as, as, far as the, you know the general kind of landscape uh, area footprint it becomes a significant part of the project there are a few tools simple so far but there are a few tools couple of tools uh, to calculate your carbon footprint and that takes me back also to what I said the work we're doing also in the landscape institute because we are trying to put together something to not to calculate but work with areas that uh, could support practices in that aspect as well. So the, the second, which is national park, there's no footprint, footprint on the ground because there's no nothing built. But obviously, you could consider as footprint, you know, the the carbon dioxide we all emit. Trying to work on that, even on that computer today. And then with Saturn, which is the European project, um, there are smaller calculations calculations of footprint in terms of uh, the farming, the agricultural activities, and some of the strategies that have happened in other areas. For example, Trento is, um, has specific activities with tourism, with uh, agriculture and farming, as has as Gothenburg. Um, so these are being thought and trying to put together. The, the tool that I mentioned that we might be uh, producing by, hopefully by the end of the project, it, Tries us to, it, try, it will try to take us from the overall the, the big scale of uh, what what relevance to SDGs, for example, of the IPCC agenda. This project has down to a bit of more detail local level of carbon footprint and how the, how could the cities um, plan, implement, or avoid something like that in the future or integrate it. Almost. Um, thank you for that. Um, anyone else having questions? Don't forget to unmute yourself if you are planning to ask a question. Everyone is very quiet. There is another comment in our chat box. Chris came back to us and said, most of those projects look expensive. What are your thoughts on some lower cost response options? Money is an issue always. Uh, yes, they, they are expensive. I mean, um, the last one, Saturn, not so much. I mean, it, it, is, it is a combination. It is a collaboration of the European Union with the cities and institutions. So there's a much funding on that. Uh, the, but I guess I sense you're talking about the overall, you know, the final design, for example, of the National Park and also the Room for the River. Yes, there there is quite a significant amount of money that have been spent in this project. But before I answer your question on, on lower cost options, that there are some, it, it's up to you of how you do it. I would like you to think what I'll say also to when I consult people or to clients is, don't just look on the money that you spend right now, but look of how much money, if you just about money, how, how much, not just money for me, but also interest, tourism, um, social pride, landscape identity will bring to your area or to any area in the future. So you might spend some money today, but actually this will come three, four, five and ten times back in the future. It might be for these strategic projects because this is not just a small park or a garden, not that I'm, I'm also horticulture, so don't, I don't enter, underestimate gardens. Obviously I'm doing them all, designing them all the time, but it's somehow trickier to calculate uh, the years or you know when you will save this money or have this money back but it has been proven and the room for the river because it now running runs for four or five years it is proving that actually it it um, 
it brings tourism, it brings businesses, it brings economy, even even local tourism, but also visitors. So to answer and to go to your question about lower cost response options, yes, there are. I mean, everybody tries to save money, but again, that has to do with sitting down with your, depending what you are, cities, local authorities, uh, teams, multidisciplinary teams, and really evaluating what are the costs, what are the expenses, and how we could you could save money by creating something brilliant. There are brilliant examples out there that they haven't spent smaller scale usually that come to mind, haven't spent a huge amount of money, but actually they have created great input. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say no, because you're asking for my thoughts. I'm just trying to think I wouldn't say no in lower cost responses. Just make sure from what I could say that you don't lose or miss value quality of space and a place where people could be and live with just thinking about money because this is where i think we've been losing the plot a bit in the past i'm not saying it's not important i'm not saying it's not an issue and i'm not saying it's not going to be a big issue after after covid but we have to find ways to remember my last slide go forward instead of going back to where we were uh keep the good things and and you know inventing something bigger or nicer. <laughs> so a follow-up question from Ben Ross. Um, what are some quick wins that can be done especially as post-COVID upset budgets? Um, not sure I fully, fully understand. So I, I guess you're talking about what we, could we, what could we do as practitioners or as practices in a post-COVID scenario, I guess, if, mm. if I'm right, clarify to me, if not, I, I see the chat, so please clarify to me, if not. But, and I'm not, I'm not pretend to be an expert on that because very simply, we, we still don't know what, in, in my sense, we still don't know what has hit us in a way. And I know um, in Australia and New Zealand, you're free, virus free now and happy to go about our lives, but there are areas that have been hit much harder. I know that there is a big discussion uh, with practitioners and also with professional bodies, as for example, the Greek uh, Pan Hellenic Association, as well as the Landscape Institute that I am in touch, of how they could support the practices. So, some of these quick wins that you're asking is collaboration, I would say. We, we need to really work together as individuals as well as practices uh, in a post-COVID world. And we need to try to invent or convince the clients that this is something that it needs to be done. One really, really significant thing that I put it in the beginning of the lecture of the talk, it was that people have actually realized the last for the past four or five months, how important open spaces are, how important uh, green spaces, landscape, farms, whatever they have on their surroundings are. So I think this is something we really need to pick up on. We, we shouldn't let it pass us as professionals, if you are talking about the professional field. And we really need to make it, convert it or you know, shift it quickly to say, well, this is what you're mi missing. This is what it is important at the end of the day. So why are you just not doing it? Or why are you just, uh, do, do you want to stuck in what you have been, you know, doing in the past or uh, common practices, etc.? I'm hoping I am kind of touching what you're asking. Just let me know if I don't. Right. Any last minute questions from our audience, from our participants? Everyone is very, very quiet. Um, and it's easy, like, just to wrap it up, um, what's your biggest advice for landscape architects in the future? What, what do we expect us that we need to upskill and be prepared for? <clears throat> Well, that goes to myself as well, I guess, as an advice. I think we, need, we really need to believe and get out there of what we are capable of. Because mm. I think there's still a big issue and it is addressed 
in lots of discussions I have with the emerging professionals as well as you know the, the established bodies is that people have the feeling of well pro professionals have the feeling that people public let's say or local authorities don't know what we could do as as landscape architects and I'm not saying it is easy I'm not saying tomorrow um, we're gonna have phone calls saying yes uh, hello you could could you do that but we might have we, we constantly need to push we constantly we are the people that we are the intermediate we could design a whole area and we could actually bring the vision to life most of I'm not that's not to that's not to offend any of the other professions as I, I said myself I'm also horticulturist my background is horticulture and agriculture before I become landscape architect and I'm working very well with all the disciplines but it is about teamwork as much as it is about really making the point of what we're capable to do so as, as an advice I think to our, to our to all of us is stay connected and um, really push and think out of the box in terms of even though it might not be easy even though it might not be the cheapest option even though it might not be the most convenient option or not what is already in policy and easy to do finished in two months for example we really need to push and create something unique something that you know it will be there for the future generations it will be there uh, for nature, for animals, as I said, we need to think, think with a fresh pair of eyes. I guess that's our, that's my, my final mm. suggestion. If if I have to summarize it. Very well. Um, there is just another question to pop in in the chat box, and uh, let's just take this one as the last one. Um, someone is asking, uh, you know, there is evidence when. Um, our economic growth slows, slows down due to COVID-19, that the environment has recovered significantly. Do you have any idea that what, why landscape planning can help people living under the circumstances of economic regression, which I think something that will be deeply affecting us over the next couple of years, I reckon. Yes, probably. <laughs> um, well, I don't have a, a full answer. I don't have a you know, these are questions that I think it, they come to us as we speak. And obviously, we we all still experience COVID in a big. And I actually had a I had a moment of thought: should I put it in or not? But the link the link with the environment has been made to me so apparent over the last two three weeks that we're kind of going not going back to reality, but you know, kind of things are improving, or we know where we stand. Um. So I think that landscape planning or designing or whatever you call it could really be, it could be the point where we either go forward, I'm really using this last slide and I hope you know it's this because this is being live stream as well, it's not mine, um, the, the art was there on the, um, on the graph, but it, it is, I think it's very powerful graph, but going forward instead of going back to normal. We want to go back to normal in our friends and lives and family, but as far as climate crisis is concerned, please let's go forward. So I think the key or the idea I have about landscape planning or designing of how we could live um, with the economic regression, it will be try to think and find ways to go forward. It's not going to be easy again. Um, we might be hit because economic depression means no money, means less project. But the projects we do, they might be, go back to ben, Ben's, I think, or Chris's question that's saying, do we have any more low cost solutions? And there are low cost solutions. It's, it's just that we have to put more effort or more hours to discover them. And this is, um, this is partly what we're trying to do with Saturn, try to, um, support local authorities, cities and institutions to really find ways to improving either, they pol either their sustainable agenda or their political agenda, etc. And I think, because um, this is obviously, this is a project that's been hit from COVID. I I'm tempting to say, I'm inclined to say that there's more to come from that because, you know, th there might be some answers we might have next year of how you could do that 
uh, on landscape as a result of COVID, COVID and, the, and their economic depression. Mm. Sorry, I know it's not the full answer, obviously, but this is yeah. still ongoing. Yeah. So we are just experiencing it. So it's very, it's very hard to make, um, you know, to have conclusions at this stage. On that note, thank you very much, Anastasia, for joining us all the way from Birmingham. Um, I think this was an excellent lecture and very, very interesting questions that um, I think will be in the back of our mind for the time being. <laughs> um, and on behalf of the New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects and Victoria University of Wellington, thank you very much uh, for, for joining us in this webinar. And all the best to you and to everyone else that is joining us from across the globe. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, great, great to have a, such a big audience and early in the morning for your time or, you know, across the world. So thank you very much. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed thank, it. Thank you for that. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.